paved roads to hell. <laughs> Let's get started. A quick show of hands. How many baseball fans here in the audience? Nobody? <laughs> Interesting. And who are the cinephiles? Oh, one or two people. Yeah, so these are the people that I'm likely to upset in the upcoming couple of minutes. So, do anybody recognize this movie scene? Have you seen it ever? Yeah, okay, I see some people nodding, and it is somewhat familiar. Um, so this is basically uh, from a movie from 1989. It's called Field of Dreams, starring Kevin Costner, and he's acting a character named uh, Ray, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so this is basically the movie scene where the quote, if you build it, he will come, originated. So in this, in, this, in this specific scene, what happens is Kevin Costner is walking through the middle of a cornfield, and then he hears a phantom voice whispering, if you build it, he will come. And then that is exactly the scene where this originated. And the movie is very inspirational. It's a feel-good movie, uh, but it, it sort of inspired the wrong crowd, the product person. So if you build it, they will come eventually landed in the product community and people started peddling it as product management advice. But what they forgot was the original quote is from a sports fantasy movie. When I hear about the word fantasy, what comes to my mind is something that is imaginative or something that is improbable or impossible. And it is never meant to be product management advice. So the feel-good vibe that comes along with that quote and all the inspiration, that is not really going to get you lifted off to where you want to go. And the only person or only community that is likely to come is your infra provider's billing team. So whatever you build and throw it to the other side of the fence, there will be infra costs associated with it. If you don't build it right, you probably wouldn't attract the right kind of people you're trying to attract. Um, so any sort of software that we develop and throw to the other side of the fence called production, especially developer platforms, uh, in the, the specific case in question is developer platforms, and they, in their entirety, must be owned, managed as a product, and they should be supported by purpose-driven teams. Um, the vocabulary used in here, well, if there is one thing to take from this talk, it is basically this sentence, and the rest is in the details. And of course, that is where the devil is. Um, the vocabulary used in here, just quickly introduce the vocabulary to everybody, so I don't want to make any assumptions, so I bring everybody up to speed. The, the definition of a stream-aligned team, it's basically a team that is aligned to a flow of work or it could be aligned to a very specific business domain. I come from a banking business, so it could be a customer onboarding team or an instant payments team. They really don't care about uh, is it running on a Kubernetes cluster that is on-premise or is it on somebody else's cloud or the, the MTU of your network card. That is least of their worries. They are all focused about how do I get a feature from an idea to delivering value to production. An internal developer platform, it's a higher order abstraction that takes away the cognitive load off from the stream aligned team. So they don't have to contemplate between how do I write some YAML to make stuff happen. They click a button, stuff happens. So the, the internal developer platforms, they abstract away a whole lot of fundamental building blocks to deliver value to production. And that includes compute, storage, networking, or other extra capabilities like machine learning, observability, identity and access management, or in the regulated industries, even governance, compliance, artifacts generation, all these things are abstracted away by an internal developer platform. Um, then a platform team is a team or a group of teams that basically builds, supports and runs the internal developer platforms. Then these internal developer platforms, as the I basically stands for internal facing stuff. So it is not really exposed to your end user customers, but it is internal facing. And the D part of it, it is basically the developers in stream aligned teams that we are targeting. 
That's where the IDP, the, the D part comes from. And enabling self-service, they all this, the, the whole purpose of IDP is basically to enable self-service through an API interface. It could be a gRPC interface or a HTTP interface. Then you build another layer of abstraction on top of it. Could be a web UI or it could be a CLI that people can use to get stuff done. So instead of writing massive amounts of YAML code, you can click a button, stuff happens, or it happens in CI/CD in some form or shape. Um, the primary job of all kind of platform initiatives is to accelerate delivery by stream aligned teams. So how can we make them uh, go from idea to production as fast as possible? That is, the, that is the concept at least. And these platforms are supposed to offer a paved road to production and that is where the paved road concept comes into picture. And you would probably hear them as golden paths or uh, paved paths as well. It's the same thing uh, we're talking about. Again, I'm going about supposed to part. If we are not careful in building these journeys that take people from idea to production, it probably would end up in a completely different place. So the stuff that we are building to accelerate people to production may become one single bottleneck that blocks progress. And that is what this talk is all about. What could possibly go wrong in there? The very first in the list is work as imagined versus work as done. So when I'm thinking about, or when we think about uh, navigating treacherous waters, maybe the picture in the left is what we think about. It's a captain sitting in his ship with all the fancy equipment. You can just use your joystick to navigate, but in reality, what is happening in real world could be something like what Captain Jack Sparrow experiences. Work as imagined is basically a simplified, uh, sanitized and generalized form of imagination that we all have about somebody else's job. Many of you might have come to this conference uh, by an airplane and we see cabin crews all the time. So cabin crew members, we always think, hey, they are probably doing catering for me, but it is just an extra feature. Cabin crew members are really safety professionals. They are trained on telemedicine. They are trained on how to do crowd management, how to do safety, how to do safety right, and how to evacuate a plane in a like, few seconds. I know this because I work for a massive airline for more than 10 years. Then, work as done. Well, what I initially hinted is basically work as imagined, how we think somebody else is doing their job. Work as done is how people do their real job. So for a stream-aligned team, what we think about their job is probably not how they want to do stuff or how they do their stuff in, in reality. Often, there is a gap between these two. So work as imagined and work as done, the drift between these two is fundamental roadblock in what you are trying to build. So. It is super important for us to understand, as platform teams, for us to understand what is your end user customers, or I mean, the consumers of your platform trying to do. And a, a, a common problem in platform teams is platform teams do not really recognize themselves as a product team. What it means is they know about their Kubernetes clusters, why did they make a decision over another couple of decisions, or how their network is routing their traffic from on-prem to another cloud provider. They can articulate all of that, but if you ask platform teams, what exactly are your consumers doing? Do you know about it? Most of the time, the answer is a blank stare. And how can we go about it? First of all, stop what you're doing. Don't build random stuff. Stop assuming what your consumers are trying to do, but rather ask your consumers, what exactly are you trying to do? Get off that ivory tower. We don't want to be like ivory tower architects of the past. We really need to get in touch with your consumers and understand what are they trying to solve? How can we enable them to get stuff done? And if necessary, occasionally work in a stream-aligned team, so you may be uh, at the core, you are a platform team member, but you should consider working in a stream-aligned team. Experience the reality. So this is somewhere, rela somewhere related to dog fooding. So you're trying to use whatever stuff you have built so that you can experience how your consumers are experiencing it. Most of the time, you can experience the pain that they experience from this experiment. And frameworks like 
jobs to be done, for instance, can be helpful. Um, the, uh, another anti-pattern that we see is failing to use the power of communities. Who recognized this artifact? Do anybody know? Yes. Nope, it's not a kebab. <laughs> so this is, it's a, it's a tablet written, written in Akkadian cuneiform. That's about 3,700 years old. Um, so this is world's first written complaint, written customer complaint. So this is like emoji, but before the Unicode standard. So what happens in this specific tablet, it is complaining about a copper merchant named E. Nasir, and E. Nasir has delivered bad quality of copper to a, 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 a consumer named Nani. And then consumer is saying, you have delivered me bad quality of copper, and when my messenger interrogated you about it, you insulted that person. And this is an artifact that display in the British Museum in London. Uh, the museum is often free to access, so if you are in London, check this out. It's about the size of a Nokia 3310 for uh, people interested. So it's, it's very hard to find where exactly it is, but it's an interesting piece of historic evidence. And I know about this tablet from internet memes. I, I really don't know any, any history. Then, people complain because they really care. It is the same case with your consumers as well. So the most important skill that we need to invest in is listening. So provide channels for people to rant their heart out. So sometimes the feedback can be in your face, harsh, but it's fine. People complain because they, they really want you to improve. The other side of people complaining is indifference. Uh, it is not really happy customer. So, so we, I, I would really recommend listening to customer complaints than indifference. Uh, so as, as a platform producer, your consumer, is, consumer community is really talented. Enable them to unblock themselves. It is easy to say, but what do I mean by this? What it means is you should really expose your code repositories or your artifacts, whatever you are building, to it should be accessible to your consumers so that they can understand what is going on behind the scenes. When they encounter random error messages, they don't have to come back to you as platform teams all the time, but they can figure it out on their own. So in the same way, uh, encourage contributions in documentation, as code, as advocacy. Your first set of customers should be selling for you. Don't try to solve that problem on your own your community can really do that heavy lifting for you. You would see in internal communication channels, people helping to each other, always try to enable that. And as platform teams, avoid sarcasm in your own support channels. I've once seen uh, when, when someone is asking question, uh, a support team member saying, my crystal ball is block broken and I need really help in understanding what is going on with you. Uh, it was a response to a specific question, but if you're at the receiving end of the stick, it is not really funny. So at all costs, avoid sarcasm in channels. Using management influence to drive adoption of platforms. This is another anti-pattern that we see in medium to large enterprises. It is a huge red flag. If you ever encounter going in that direction, please stop. So find out what exactly is driving engineers away from your platform and try to fix that. Engineers will come when there are incentives for them. It could be a niche capability that you are providing through your platform. Um, so it may be a, a capability that you offer to reduce busy work that people have to do, or it may be making something easier, faster, secure, one of those stuff. And no amount of policy and propaganda is going to counter for a broken product. Um, so I, I like this quote coming from Dr. Holly Cummins. She says, when the friction cause of getting work done, developers leave. And people not just leave, they talk to their, their peers, their friends about that as well. And it can even impact your hiring pipelines. Another anti-pattern is unreal expectations. Stop trying to make everybody happy. You're not tequila or you're not beer, or insert your own uh, beverage there. Build for the majority. You don't have to really build for 100% of your community. There will always be outliers. So 
pick them what works for them. And internal facing does not really imply you have a, a relaxed service level objective. You are just like any other production thing that could be customer facing. So don't really uh, treat your customers like mushrooms. And stop shipping favors. So you might have received some uh, favors from your peers as product managers or engineers. So don't try to sneak in favors in return. It most likely would result in technical debt. And I really don't think anybody purposely built broken platforms. The road to hell is always paved with good intentions. Nobody holds their asses to work in the morning to do a terrible job. And when we know the patterns that we discussed already, you can really do course corrections. It is just a start of a stream of uh, patterns that we can find out. But one last thing, auditory hallucination is real. If you hear fandom voices, but you cannot see any person around it, consult a doctor, please. And thanks for listening. <laughs>